Lab number 11 is entitled the Dorm Entertainment System. Many students have an MP3 player and, and listen to music using headphones. You can purchase a docking station where you could take your MP3 player and connect it to a set of speakers. What we're going to take a look at in this lab is how to make something like that. Well, if you're going to try to drive a speaker, one of the problems we're going to run into if we use an op -amp circuit is that op -amps generally have some type of internal protection so that you don't melt the integrated circuit. For the 741 op amp, and really almost any silicon based op amp, the limitations of current are on the order of around 25 milliamps. What this means is you can take in 25 milliamps and put out 25 milliamps. Let's see what that means in maybe an example. Let's look at a non inverting amplifier with a plus and minus 6 volt power supply. What that's going to mean is that we can probably swing a signal almost up to 6 volts, but in reality, probably something more like plus or minus 5. So if our output was limited to 5, say sine omega t, if we had a gain of 11, 1 plus the resistor ratio, that would make an input something of 5 elevenths or smaller. Suppose now that you had a, a load here, at what point do you begin to draw this 25 milliamps of current? Well the current that comes out of here goes down this path and down here if we create a positive output voltage. Because this is 11k, and we're looking at putting a fairly low resistance here, like a speaker, most of that current's going to go this way back to ground. Now, if you take 5 volts peak and divide it by the most current you could get here, which would be 25 milliamps, you're looking at a resistor for a load of around 200 ohms. And what this means then is if you look at the current in this resistor, you're going to go up to 5 volts divided by R sub L and then swing down the same amount. But if R sub L were 200 ohms or larger, then this current would not exceed 25 milliamps. But on the other hand, if you had a load here that was less than 200 ohms, this is for R sub L, then if you get to the peak of the output, the output's going to stop at 25 milliamps. That's what the current limiter means. And then when the output goes negative, current's going to come back into the circuit, a little go back down this way, and most of it's going to go back into the output. And here again, too, we can either put out or take in 25 milliamps. So if we're looking at an 8 ohm speaker, maybe a 4 ohm speaker, uh, we can't use a 741 op amp to drive it because the load is much, much less than 200 ohms. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a power booster to the output stage, take a look at some of its properties. So here we've got two transistors, an NPN and a PNP, and just a power supply, and it's negative. And then I've got an input here, and then some load over here. Say this is our speaker. To see all that's going to be going on with the transistors, let's use a more detailed SPICE model. This is a very detailed model for a power transistor made by Texas Instruments, or at least was made by Texas Instruments. And take a look at what it does. Um, so here I'm going to put in a signal, a sine wave, 6 volts at 1 kilohertz, and I'm going to use a plus and minus 6 volt power supply. Take a look at the next page. It kind of shows what the output looks like versus the input. So here's my input. It's going between plus and minus 6 volts. And my output goes up to 5.3 has a little bit of distortion over here, then it goes down to minus 5.2, and then repeats itself. You can also plot the output versus the input, and we get a curve that looks something like this. It's flat here, and then a slope and a slope, where this slope is around 1. And let's go back and look at the circuit, so you can figure out what's going on. When the input's positive and large enough, we see that the output was positive. For current to flow in this direction, you've got to be able to supply a base current. And that means that this base emitter of transistor 1 is forward biased. But when that occurs, the bottom transistor is reverse biased because we've got the minus and the plus sign here. So the top transistor, when it's on, say in the active region, the bottom transistor is in cutoff. Right? The output voltage, if you just go back around the loop here, the rise in voltage would equal the drop. So the output voltage is minus the base emitter drop of transistor 1 plus V sub S. So we see a one diode drop difference between the input and the output look at page 3 again. So when the input was positive and its maximum, we saw that the output was about one diode drop less, or really one base emitter drop less. Take a look at the negative swing. Let me just erase this. When the input's negative and the output's negative, current's going to be coming back this way. Can't go back this way, can only go back this way to ground. And so we have some base current then coming out. All right, so then the output voltage, the rise in voltage, equals the emitter base voltage plus V sub S. But remember V sub S is negative. So when V sub S reaches its most negative value, we'll have a difference again of one base emitter, really in this case emitter base drop. And you can see that right over here, it's the 5.2 volt. 
NPN transistors base emitter drop is around 0.7 and for the PNP it's around 0.8. Again, I'm using a very detailed model. Uh, all, all the nonlinearity is really included. When the bottom transistor is on, the top one's off. What we really have is an emitter follower. The output is equal to the input minus the diode drop. So if there's an increase in input, basically no drop increase across here or here, then all that change shows up at the output. This is summarized on the bottom of the page. Now there is a portion of the curve here where the input voltage is not positive enough or negative enough to forward bias the base emitter or emitter base junction. In that case, we just have both transistors cut off. And then when, when the top transistor is on, the bottom one's off, we have the output equals the input. And the same thing is true on this side. So we're getting a voltage gain that's just approaching one. But really what we've got is current gain. Let's take a look at some of the properties of that. Here's a graph of the current in the collector of the NPN transistor and then the collector current in the PNP transistor. Now in SPICE, if you recall, the collector current was defined in the opposite direction that we've been talking about in, in class. It's coming into the collector, but in reality for a PNP, it's actually coming out. So you can see there's a positive quantity. Now when the top transistor is on, the bottom one's off, and the collector current is approximately the same as the emitter current, because the beta of the transistor is fairly high. And that current flows into the load, in our case, that's going to be the speaker. I want to figure out how much power I'm able to deliver to that resistive load. Part of doing that is trying to find the average value of this current. We'll take a look at the power calculation on the next page. The average current of a time varying waveform, or really the average of anything, is 1 over the period integral over a period of the function dt. So in this portion here, we have roughly a sine wave with a peak value of I sub c of transistor 1 peak and then the sine of omega t. A little bit of a crossover distortion, we'll just ignore that to make the algebra here a little bit easier. And then the integral over this part of the period is just going to be equal to zero. Omega is equal to 2 pi f, and you can write that as 2 pi divided by the period. And then we're looking at only having a signal for half the period. And then we can bring this constant out in front. There's a peak value of the sine wave. And then we're taking the integral of the sine of omega t dt. So that's going to be equal to the cosine, really minus the cosine, of omega t. And then we're going to multiply that by 1 over this quantity. In other words, the integral of the sine of ax is minus 1 over a cosine of ax. Then we're going to evaluate this from 0 to t over 2. Now I'm going to bring this term out in front here, and the t's cancel, so our periods drop out. And we're just left with a 2 pi divided into the peak. And then we've got the cosine of 2 pi over t evaluated at t over 2, and then evaluated at 0. Now, cosine of 0 is just equal to 1, so we'll go minus 1. But here we've got the periods again canceling. The 2's cancel, and I've got the cosine of pi, which is the cosine of 180, which is also equal to minus 1. So I have minus 2 here, canceling the minus and the 2 that's here. So the average value of this, what looks like a halfway rectified waveform, is the peak value divided by pi. Now that occurs quite often in electronics, so it's kind of worth remembering that. We find the same value for the integral for this current in the PNP transistor, so too is just the peak value divided by pi. I'm going to calculate efficiency. Take a look at the properties of this amplifier, what's called class B. The average power that's supplied by the power supply is the integral of the product of voltage and current of each of the two power supplies. So what we've got is the current coming out of the top power supply into the collector, and then our, our bottom power supply is a negative supply, and so we've got current going into the minus term. So they're both supplying power to the circuit. The battery VCC and minus VCC are just a constant, so that just comes out in front. And then I'm left with the integral of the current in the collector of transistor 1 and the current in the collector of transistor 2. And we've just shown that their average values are just the peaks divided by pi. Power that's coming in from the power supply is VCC over pi and then the sum of the two peak currents. Current that's peaking in the collector is also the current that's going in the load. And that's really the maximum of the output divided by R sub L. And so what we've got in the output is the maximum of the input 
minus the base emitter drop. For I sub C of transistor 2, this is the PNP, it's swinging negative. So when the output's negative, the current then would be positive. And as we showed before, that's equal to the emitter base drop minus, or it's actually plus V sub S, but then that's equal to minus the negative peak. And so the minus signs here cancel, and we wind up getting the peak again, because the waveform is symmetric, minus the emitter base of transistor 2. So we can now put that together and calculate our power in as V sub C, C over pi. And then I've got the value of the current, which is the difference of these two voltages divided by R sub L, and then the current in transistor 2, which is the difference of these two voltages. So what I've got is twice the, the peak value, which is really the peak to peak value, and then we lose the two diode drops or the emitter base, base emitter drops. Now the power going out is likewise the integral of the voltage times the current divided by the period integrated over a period. But if the output's a perfect sine wave, then it's just the RMS value of the voltage and the current, or you could write it as the RMS squared over R sub L, or the current squared RMS times R sub L. So we can now calculate the power out as roughly the peak to peak of the output divided by two, and then if it's a perfect sine wave, we just be dividing by the square root of two. So when I square that, I'm going to get 2 times 2, and then the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, which gives me 8, which is the bell. And then the peak-to-peak -peak value is the positive peak minus the negative peak. So we get, again, the peak-to-peak -peak value minus the base emitter drop of transistor 1, that's the NPN, and then minus the emitter base of the PNP transistor. Now efficiency is power out over power in. So here was our power out expression. And then our power in expression up here, we're just going to take the reciprocal of that. So we'll have the VCC in this bracketed quantity in the denominator, and then the numerator will have pi in R sub L. Now what's interesting is that the R sub L drops out. It turns out a speaker's impedance varies with frequency. The efficiency in this particular design is going to be independent of the value of the load that we have hooked up. One of the squares cancels here with, with this. And we're left then with an efficiency of our bracketed quantity divided by VCC. And then times pi over 8 times 100% would be the efficiency. So in the example that we just looked at, our output, well our input was 6 volts. So we have 12 volts peak to peak. We had a, a forward biasing at its peak of 0.7 drop across the base emitter of the NPN transistor. And we had 0.8 for the PNP transistor. So it gives us about 68% efficiency. Theoretically, the best you could ever do is when this term is huge compared to this. So if we use a bigger power supply, it would be 20 volts plus or minus, then these terms would be very small, and you could essentially neglect them. And what you've got here really is twice the maximum input, and that can be no bigger than the power supply. So if that was equal to the power supply, that would just drop out, and this is the theoretical efficiency of a it's called a class B amplifier. Let me make a point here. The class B amplifier is operating in the active region for half the cycle. In the circuits we've been studying in ECE302, we've been operating in the active region for the entire cycle. That's called a class A amplifier. We'll look at some of the efficiencies of that in the chapter 7 notes. Now what's interesting is when there's no input, there's no output. But that means we're also in the case where we're in this dead zone where we don't have enough voltage to turn on either transistor. So we're not consuming any power. Now you can't calculate efficiency here because you got zero over zero, but the reality is you're not taking in any power. So, so what we've got is an excellent scenario of saving our batteries because when there's no music, we're not taking in any power. Suppose that the input were three volts peak instead of six volts peak. The efficiency would actually change. Here we'd have a twice the value of our back here on top of our of our input voltage peak, but now if that was half of what it was before, we just have three volts, and that would give us an efficiency of 29%. So the efficiency is going to change with the input signal. The good news is that the the best efficiency occurs when the input is maximum. And that's when you want to get the most power out, and whatever doesn't go out is dumped into the transistors. And that'll eventually cause some heating and maybe a need for heat sinks. We'll also talk about this in the chapter 7 notes.